Hi, welcome to Research and Analysis 2. I'm Dahlia Rembler. One of my students once said to me, this course is about does the study really say what it says it says? So the idea is that when you're presented with a piece of research or analysis or even just the kind of informal presentation of analysis we get all the time of data through analytics and so on. The idea is that you should learn how to extract valid and actionable evidence. Valid meaning you're interpreting it correctly. And actionable means that you can extract from it what you need for your situation. And what my student was getting at is that you should avoid being misled by people who are making claims that aren't right. Sometimes consciously, but often they don't know better. And you're also going to have to recognize and deal with uncertainty. A lot of the time is going to be, well, we don't know, or we have this slight clue. So, as I've been emphasizing, this should make you a good consumer of research and analysis in any form. Performance measurement, analytics, whatever. It should also help you commission research and analysis. So, if you contract out or uh, you, someone else is designing a dashboard for you, how to get what you need out of it. And although it's not our main focus, you'll also learn how to do your own research and analysis of certain types. Won't suddenly make you into some fantastic research or analysis, but you will learn to do things for yourself. Okay, so in this first chapter, we're going to get an introduction with a bit more motivation. And we call this chapter Research in the Real World because the emphasis is especially for practitioners and for applied researchers how this fits into what you want to do in whatever aspect of the world you work in and want to influence. We're also going to get an introduction to some of the most basic concepts. So what are research methods. Well, broadly, they're the techniques and procedures that produce research evidence. That could be sampling strategies, if you want to describe a population of people or of websites or of whatever. How do you get examples of them to, an to analyze? What procedures, what strategies do you have? Measurement instruments. So that could be a physical instrument, a thermometer, um, or, you know, pollution measurement, but it could also be a questionnaire, the set of questions you ask on a survey, and all the other things about how you implement the survey. It could also be about how you analyze data once you've got it. So comparisons that you make between groups or more advanced statistical techniques. Um, it can be an enormous variety of things, and new things are developed all the time, like scraping data off the internet. So why do research methods matter? Why should you know what they are? Well, good evidence comes from well-made research. If you want to know if your program works and how well it works, you really want the answer to that. You don't want some fake answer, and you don't want to misinterpret what you have. Same for what we're going to call descriptive research. If you think that there's a problem or there's not a problem, it's good to actually get that right. There are some more strategic things. Um, using methods to win. When you're debating people or trying to make a case, if you have better evidence, that can help you um, win your argument. And research-savvy people um, are increasingly desired in a lot of jobs. What you normally hear is data, data, data. But as we'll be talking about, it's not just data, although that's important, but it's what you do with it, how you analyze it, how you interpret it. So here's an analytics dashboard. Analytics is a term we hear all the time. 
And in fact, dashboards are designed for you kind of not to need training. Um, the idea is they'll present things to you in the form you need, and they certainly try to. And if you're involved in designing an analytics dashboard, that's what you want. But so let's look a bit closely. So this is taking information from multiple sources, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So first of all, you want to think, okay, what are we missing? Are there other social media platforms that we might want that are important to the population? Then some of the things like page impressions are pretty well defined. You can look it up and it basically says any click. Then there's something called engaged users. What's an engaged user? How do I decide what's engaged? What do I mean by engage? How did they define it? Is that really what I want? So that's getting into some of the measurement things you're going to learn. And when you see something like engage users, you need to think, okay, what do they mean by that? How did they operationalize it? What do I mean by it? What do I want to know about engaged users? So here's another dashboard. This is a COVID dashboard from John Hopkins University. Um, this page is focused on the entire world. They have you can focus on specific countries. Um, it's also focused on deaths. Uh, you can see here, and there's something called confirmed deaths, and that's again getting at some of these measurement ideas. You may remember that way back in July 2020, when this screenshot is from, it was still the case that often tests uh, were hard to get. So we couldn't know for sure if someone died of COVID. And people who come in with a lot of comorbidities, you know, it may, they may technically have died of something else. Even if you had COVID, well, you probably literally died of some other thing. So that's kind of emphasizing their definitional issues of confirmed cases. You also see the option to present it again in this lower red right in logarithmic scale. Um, when things grow exponentially, as we've all now personally experienced, they go really, really fast. And so you may want to be able to have data which will help you see the rate of change, which logarithmic. So how does research fit into policy and practice? So starting with the most informal, well, not really the most informal, that would be, hey, you've got a couple of measurements of how you're doing sitting around, and you're going to analyze that. Analytics is a bit more formal than that. Then there's a performance measurement where you commit to measuring uh, certain uh, features, outcomes, or what's going on in your organization in a consistent way, and you track that. Evaluation research, again, is yet more formal. We want to know the impact of some program on some well-defined outcomes. And then there's what's often called evidence-based policy and programs. And the idea is that you or various organizations will use evidence that comes from outside from uh, well-established researchers, and you'll use that to help you decide what to implement. So I've already talked to you about why research methods matter. Now I want you to think of some examples of this. So in the videos, I'm going to try and have active learning where you should try and stop the video and answer the questions yourself. If you don't have time for that, what I suggest is remember the questions and sometime when you're washing the dishes or taking the subway, try and answer them. So first, think of a policy debate. How is research used to support one side or another? Um, so this will be a debate and they'll say, well, evidence shows this. Similarly, think of an important social problem that people are trying to improve. How is research evidence being used to address this issue? 
And if you can't think of an example like that, hopefully by the end of this course, that'll be almost second nature. And then finally, think of a top job in your field. How is knowledge of research methods useful in that position? And if you're interested in active learning, or if you're interested in how to learn the content of this course well, or another course, I'm making a plug for my How to Learn document, both how to learn in this course and more generally. So evidence is important, but evidence can actually mislead. And avoiding being misled, again, is one of the main goals of this course. So first of all, there's misleading measurements. The book talks about test scores, you know, those high take stakes tests in education, and how even if the tests were consistent over time, different other features of how the tests are implemented, like giving people lots of sample questions that are almost identical to the ones on the test, so they can learn to get it right even if they don't understand, um, that ended up being a misleading measurement, inconsistent over time. Also, as I mentioned, think about COVID testing, right? So you might say, ah, well, the tests are accurate, but as we know, some are more accurate than others. And some are accurate for do you have it, and others not for do you have it, but are you contagious? Um, and now, again, more active learning, think for yourself about some misleading measurements. Maybe it was a job evaluation that you had or you've seen where how they evaluate you or someone else isn't really relevant to what it means to perform well on that job. There's also misleading samples. So think about uh, a reputable survey uh, organization trying to systematically sample, get a representative sample. We'll learn a lot more of that in this course versus just going out and asking for volunteers. You can well imagine that if MSNBC asks for volunteers and Fox at volunteers on the same topic, they're going to get pretty different answers as neither of them are going to be representative of the general population. And again, with COVID, we talked about how easy it is to get a test or not. So not just what the test has, uh, measures as we just discussed, but who it's sampling who gets a test. And finally, misleading correlations. That's a big theme in this course. Um, by misleading correlations, I mean people misinterpreting a real correlation that's there for a causal impact. So example in the book, uh, nightlights and myopia. They did a study and they saw that when children had nightlights, they were more likely to have myopia, bad vision. But then they discovered actually what's going on is parents who have myopia, because of their vision problems, they're more likely to put nightlights in. And since there's a genetic component, their children are more likely to have myopia. So people were interpreting that as the effect of nightlights, but really it wasn't. Um, so another COVID example um, that may or may not be wrong. You hear a lot about how um, home learning, remote education is bad for children's mental health and for teens' mental health. The thing is, the periods of remote learning are caused by bad COVID outbreaks, a lot of virus surges that does all sorts of other things to people. It makes family members to the children get sick or maybe die. It means that parents may lose jobs. All kinds of things are disrupted. So how do we tell how much is the remote learning and how much is all the other bad things going on at the same time? So for all of these, try and think of examples of misleading evidence. 
So uh, in my day, you often heard people say, oh, I'm going to the library to do some research. Nowadays, people will often say, well, I'm going online to do some research. Um, when people say that, they mean what we call secondary research. That means searching for research information produced by others. Our focus in this course is the methods to do primary research. Those are, that's like the production of the research or information. That involves original data collection, going out and collecting new data for yourself, and or original data analysis. Maybe somebody else produced the data, but you're analyzing it in some new way. So primary research comes in many shapes or sizes. We already discussed some of them, but large-scale surveys, lab experiments, merging all kinds of data from across the internet, complex analyses of administrative data, focus groups, all kinds of things. And there are some more things you need to know about research. First of all, it's contingent. That means you did it about a certain time, place, context, and so it applies to that time, place, and context. And that's especially true for social research, research about the social world that we live in, politics, um, management, and so on. But at the same time, and here's a real tension, the goal of research is to generalize, to apply it to other situations and populations. After all, if the research literally only applied to that time, that place, that context, it couldn't inform about anything else. And so you might say, particularly if you're a practitioner or a policymaker, well, what good is that to me? So to be useful, the research also has to generalize. And assessing the generalizability of research, which can be very contingent, is one of the key goals of this course. So you're going to be constantly looking at a study or a piece of analysis and trying to figure out other situations of populations it'll generalize to. That's not like a perfect technical thing. There isn't some algorithm. There's algorithms to help you, but there isn't some way to do it for sure. It's a bit of a craft or even an art. Um, so remember, social research is continued but you want to generalize from it. It's uncertain too. And not just the uncertainty you learned about in statistics, which was basically sampling error. It's uncertain for all kinds of other reasons, as we will learn. It's imperfect. It has strengths and weaknesses. I've been doing this a while. You give me any study, if I spend a bit of time with it, I can kind of rip it to shreds. Um, and if it's my own research, oh boy, I can really rip it to shreds. I know all the things that are wrong with it. But almost all research also has major strengths, and you can learn from it. So you want to learn to pick apart the research, but you also want to understand that those don't undermine it having use. Because of these informations, Understanding something, drawing conclusions, it comes from a body of evidence. Different studies have different strengths and weaknesses, so they all fit together to produce a body of evidence. Um, and research involves competition and criticism. So you want to learn not to think that criticism is about you, you failed. It's about the research and analysis, and the criticism can help make a piece of research better if you have a proposal. Um, but you can also just say, well, that was good. That was the best thing you could do in that context, but it has problems. It has those weaknesses. So research also involves competition different researchers doing things in different ways, and the people getting together to figure out what's best. Research is quantitative. It can be about numbers or categories. It can be qualitative, uh, words, images, or mixture. 
Research can also be applied or basic. So basic, you might think, oh, well, that's the laws of physics. Um, there can also be basic research about psychology and how humans think that's relevant to social research. We're going to focus on applied research in this course, things with immediate policy and practice kinds of applications. But really, there's kind of a continuum between basic and applied. There's another way to categorize research, and it's really the organizing theme of this whole course. And that's descriptive research versus causal research. Descriptive research questions answer just what is. How is the world now? How has it been in the past? So what were COVID-19 hospitalizations in New York City from January 2020 to January 2022? how the world is. Causal research answers what if questions. So this is, these are impact questions. How would the world be different? What would be the impact of some program, some policy? So what would COVID-19 hospitalizations have been in New York City if everyone had worn high quality masks? So you can do a what if question going backwards historically and or you can do it going forward hypothetically. What difference would it make in the future? You know, how would COVID-19 hospitalizations be effective if everyone in New York City were to wear high quality masks from now on? These are what if questions. They're kind of two different possible worlds. Um, and that's important to practitioners and policymakers because you want to make a difference in the world. You want to know how well does this program work? What difference does it make, if any? And causal research, those are like narrow what if questions, one program, uh, which is going to be our focus in this class. But causal research also feeds into a why things are the way they are more broadly, with lots of this affects, that affects the other thing. So think of a social or policy issue of interest to you. And, uh, and try and think of both a descriptive research question and a causal research question. So think of the many things that you think you know, and then think about how do you know that they're true? Um, some things you learned about because of tradition, some things you learned about because someone in authority told you about them, I told you that it's true and you think that authority knows or maybe everyone around you knows something and you kind of absorb that by osmosis. I mean obviously this is an important thing we all think about now when you talk about misinformation and all the things that people know that maybe you think is wrong. So there are many ways of knowing things. The scientific method is a particular approach. It comes from the natural sciences, especially the physical sciences, and it means systematically observing things, using logical explanations. So using logic as a way to figure out if evidence does or does not imply the conclusion. Uh, using prediction, so coming up with a theory, making a prediction, and seeing if the evidence um, supports or contradicts it, and openness, being willing to throw out a theory um, or a piece of knowledge, no matter how much you like it or where you got it, and skepticism, especially skepticism of your own thinking. So... A lot of people are not certain that the scientific method truly applies to social science. And there is a, no doubt a strain because, you know, what does poverty mean? That's kind of socially constructed. Different people see and understand different things in the same context. 
in this course, um, we're going to take the approach. I believe that when you're studying social kinds of things, you can't be perfect in the scientific method. It's social reality is not physics. It's much more contingent, among other issues. But that this provides a u very useful way to get closer to the truth. So, you know, not everyone agrees with that, but it's had a lot of value in terms of making programs better, for example. So we're going to go with it. A further issue is that this approach, trying to do research and gain evidence, is very, very valuable. But you are not going to be able to do it for yourself all the time. You're not even going to be able to do the kind of in-depth look at what other people have done in their research. So you are going to end up trusting authorities in some sense. But this will give you the tools so that when it's important to take a closer look at what the authorities have, have discovered, you'll be able to do that. And again, you'll also be able to look at the methods to see if it generalizes, it applies in your specific situation. So there are another way of looking at what research is or how people learn is to talk about induction and deduction. You don't have to remember the jargon, but you do have to remember the ideas. So deduction is going from a theory or a model or a hypothesis, an explanation, and using that to guide data collection, analysis, systematic observation more broadly. Um, induction is kind of, oh, we got a bunch of data. We did a bunch of measurements. We, we know what we got. We measured a bunch of things. We did an analysis. Going from that to a theory, model, hypothesis, a logical explanation. Both kinds of research are very valuable, but they're different. And you can't really do both with the same data set. So you can't go out, gather a bunch of data, explore it, look at all these different correlations, relationships, use that to develop a theory, and then say, oh, I'm going to go gather some data to test my theory and test it with the same data. Well, you already know that data got this theory. You've got to use your theory to make a prediction and investigate it with new data. Um, this gets into the issue of something called data mining that we'll talk about before. Maybe you think, oh, data mining, that's one of the things that is big now in big data and um, uh, all that kind of stuff um, and data science. Um, but I was taught that, oh, data mining is a terrible, awful thing that no reputable researcher will do. Turns out both is true. So what am I talking about? Well, what I learned in grad school was bad is you get this data set, you play with it, you ex do exploratory research, you come up with a theory, have that theory. And now with the same data set, and data sets were precious then, sometimes they're still precious, um, you go and you test it, and yay, 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 my theory is right. That is really bad. Very, very common, but not good. That's the kind of data mining that's bad. The kind of data mining people do in data science now is they have a ton of data, big data. They take their data set, they divide it up into a whole bunch of separate data sets. They take one data set, often called a training data set, and, I'm sorry, yeah, um, and they explore on it. They look for relationships. They develop theories. They take that theory or that model that they've developed it, and they go to one of their other data sets, like a validation data set or a testing data set, and they see if their model still works, if their prediction still works. So proof requires fresh data.
So we've talked about how you can use research and what you're going to learn in this class in different ways. Consuming research. We've given a bunch of examples of that. Commissioning it. Once you know more about research and what it can do and how to do it well, and also what you will and will not be able to learn realistically, that can help you commission research. It can also help you conduct research, and that can be formal research that you will do, but it also can be all kinds of evaluations and performance measurement within your own organization. So now, again, take a moment, think about when have you done any of these things? And when have you wanted to or thought it would be useful? Finally, we're going to talk a bit about the ethics of research. You can read a bit more in the book. Um, the ethics of research depend a lot on the former context. The ethics of research are different if you're running a randomized experiment than if you're doing a survey, than if you're collecting administrative data, the kinds of things we all give out, you know, in order to, say, be a student at a university. The ethics of those things really vary. They're very different. So in this course, we're going to talk about the ethics uh, of methods when we get to that method. Still, there are some principles that have been established respect for the person, beneficence, meaning doing well by them, not harming them, justice between different groups. Um, those things aren't always perfectly respected, even in the kind of research that is done in universities um, and medical centers where there are ethical review boards. And you might think, well, in all the research that's done in like private businesses, such as in tech, are they really doing all of those things? So what about informed consent? Meaning that if you're going to be a research subject, you need to agree and you need to be understand what you're getting into. Well, you know, when we click all of those agree, 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 which go on endlessly forever in order to do anything, yeah, we're kind of agreeing. Is that informed consent? So in your own careers, you're going to want to think about what does it mean to be ethical as we try and learn if our programs are effective or learn about our clients.